All right, our guest today is Will Salatan. He's the national correspondent at Slate. Will Salatan, welcome to the news. I was going to say welcome back, but you've never been before. This is I've never been on a podcast. Great, great to talk with you. Um, and you have been, I have to say, man, um, for someone who, you know, like, like yours truly, I mean, you're, you're at a, at a mainstream outlet and, um, you are your Twitter handle, which is at just Salatan. Um, you've just been so intellectually honest and so brave lately, uh, that I felt like we had to have a whole conversation on this. Well, we can have a whole conversation about the idea of Twitter bravery, which is kind of an oxymoron. So, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, on one hand, you're, it's, it's not like we're out there uh, actually <laughs> on the streets. But, you know, there is a, there's different types of bravery. You know, there's, there's, there's a physical courage. There are people who, are phys- who, are, uh, who have physical courage who are like political cowards. And uh, Twitter is a dangerous place, my friend. So I, I don't I don't discount this this by the way I don't discount this this there is a Twitter bravery. I guess uh, the worst thing that's going to happen to you on Twitter is you're going to get canceled. So not the end of the world. Well, I mean, if if you care about putting food on your family's table, it, it couldn't it could matter. You know, losing your job is a pretty a pretty big deal. I you and I are both gainfully employed. Thankfully, that's all great. Um, but you, you brought up being canceled. I mean, we have seen it happen. I mean, there are people just in recent days, uh, recent weeks at places like Bon Appetit or the New York Times uh, who have been canceled for, for various infractions. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a scary, it's a scary place. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think of it so much as scary. Um, I mean, you know, given the context, I'm scared of coronavirus. Uh, I'm scared of violence. Um, so, you know, the threat that's, that we're seeing right now in terms of illiberalism, um, censorship, pressure to silence or conform, that's, it's a threat and we have to meet it. Um, is it scary? Um, I think it's galvanizing, right? I mean, it's, it's something that... I, my ability to influence the things that are truly scary is very limited. Um, I can't, I don't have much of an effect on something like the coronavirus, but, but there are some things that I can affect just by speaking. And the rise of uh, illiberalism, I can't even affect that on the right. You can, maybe. Uh, I can try to affect it on the left. So. I'm trying to affect what I can affect, not necessarily what's the most scary thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it, it makes perfect sense. Um, but I think it does take courage because there are a lot of people who just go with the flow. I mean, they see which way the winds are blowing. And it seems to be uh, a lot of uh, outlets have, you know, millennials who are not wedded to the old-fashioned liberal ideas about sort of diversity of thought and inquiry and uh, the right to be wrong and, uh, you know, I don't know, things like due process, like those, because, um, you know, because actually what they think is that it was like a a, a false pretense that we should ever have any sort of uh, objectivity, uh, that, that really we should be on the side of what's morally right. Now, I encourage them to join my pro-life cause, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's probably not gonna happen. But, um, you know, people standing up, and it, you use the word illiberal, and I think that's, I mean, am I correct to say that you, you see yourself as a liberal, uh, not, certainly not as a conservative, but as a liberal, and the things that you are trying to defend are actually liberal values? Yeah, I guess I would say that I'm often, being somewhat liberal, I'm often uncertain what I stand for. Um, you know, I, I, Jonah Goldberg once said that, like, I was one of those people who my mind was so open, like, I was gonna, like, my brain was gonna fall out of it, um, out of my skull. Uh, so you can, people like me can be kind of squishy um, when times are squishy, but we can also, find it clarifying to be in a time when there's a threat or an evil. And um, so 
right now I perceive a threat and it's helped, it has helped me to clarify to myself what I stand for. Yeah. So I accept your definition. I am a liberal. Um, and nowadays to me, that does not mean as opposed to conservative nowadays, it means as opposed to illiberalism, which exists in various forms on the left and the right. Yeah. yeah. I think so. so I, find, I noticed that Bill Kristol, for example, has been uh, using the word liberal a lot lately. Um, there are a lot of people who are classical liberals in part. They're also conservatives of various kinds, but they now find themselves thinking of themselves as liberals because of what they're up against. Yeah. yeah I think Bill Crystal wants to claim the term liberal, <laughs> actually. Um, yeah, no, it, it, I can just say personally, um, I started taking on trying to police and take on the right people ostensibly on my side of the aisle as a conservative, like, you know, maybe going back to like 2014, 2015, 20, you know, there was a time when I did that and it's, it's super dangerous. I mean, it, it, it's people on your own side. Um, civil wars are, civil wars are, are the bloodiest kinds of wars. And, uh, and there are people on the right who don't care what liberals say, but if you're, calling yourself a conservative and you don't line up with their right-wing view then they see you as the enemy and so i suspect the same is true like um there probably are progressives who i'm guessing who like really really hate you uh because they see what you're doing maybe as like a more of a betrayal than like let's say what i'm doing they might expect me to be opposed to them but they would they want you to be on their on their side is that a phenomenon yeah, it's, it, it very much is. And I think it's in the nature of illiberals. Um, so let's say on the left, the progressive illiberals, they are the illiberal progressives. They, the, it's in their nature to uh, want to cleanse, purify their side so they can have a fight. They're very, one of the traits of the illiberals is how overconfident they are. Um, but they need to extinguish this sort of squishy moderate type so they can have a clear fight with what they perceive as the evil. They, they're full of righteousness and self-righteousness. And they, you know, if I were going to tweak the folks on the left, and I, I'm trying not to tweak. I mean, I don't, I'm trying not to be one of the fight pickers. And there are a lot of people who think like me who are liberal, but who really enjoy picking fights with the liberals. And I, I, I try not to do that. But if I, if I were going to do that, which I'll do right now, uh, I would say, that it's the, very similar to the way that um, in gender, right? There's male, there's female, and nothing horrifies people who like a nice, clear gender binary than somebody who's in between. Uh, if you're if you're a tough guy, like you know, I don't like the queers. I, I like women. Women are clear. Like there's there's us, and then there's them. But I don't want somebody who's like in between. I don't want RuPaul, right? And I think. People like me are kind of rude polished to them, and they're we're we're upsetting because we're a little bit liberal, we're a little bit conservative, we're sort of in the middle, a little bit country, and they want to rock and roll. Binary. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I know what you're saying. Um, it is interesting though, I mean, because I do see parallels, like I said, uh, with me trying to keep and failing, trying and failing to keep the right from going with Trump and from going off the crazy train. Uh, it obviously didn't work, and I. But I spent years um, thinking about like how that happened. Like how did why did the right go that way? How did it happen? Was I wrong about who I thought we were? Right, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts as to why the left is now going through this. Why progressives are now adopting illiberal? And I mean, you know, there, I, I have a couple of hypotheses. Uh, one would be that this is just the the logical. Ex extinction, extension, uh, the logical extension of what we saw on campus culture, uh, on, on college campuses, um, which, uh, which apparently correlates with Twitter and, and the rise of social media, right? Um, and another, another reason could just be the, uh, the backlash against Trump and, and the alt-right, that this, this is the response to that. But do you, have, do you have any thoughts on where this comes from? Well, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about the right. For the left, I think the answer is, it is in the nature of progressives to push. 
that's what they do. So when, you know, when they're in the minority or when they're out of power, they're going to push. And often when things need to change. So like right now we're having a big around race. And there hey, Will, is Will. a long list of things. Well, you, you can you just repeat that sentence? You broke up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so right now we're having kind of a progressive moment around race. Uh, the, the culture is moving in the direction of addressing racism in the history of the United States. And it's, so what the progressives are going to do is push. And so some of what they're going to accomplish is to do things that should have been done decades ago mm -hmm. and that they were pushing. So we're going to rename a bunch of military bases. We're going to hopefully bust some police unions, although I don't, I don't know how they feel about busting unions. We're going to clean up a lot of systemic racism. Uh, we're going to address it, hopefully. And those are all good progressive values, but it is in the nature of progressives not to stop. They're just going to keep pushing. They're going to do more and more. So when you hear progressives saying, and let's abolish police departments, they're not going to be the people who say, well, well, let's not abolish police. That's not good for anyone. It's not good for the people who live in the poor neighborhoods that you're claiming to speak for. Somebody else, conservatives or moderates, is going to have to play that role. So I think my answer to your question is progressives just keep pushing and they will push out other policies and they will push out other opinions. Yeah. And other people have to be judicious about where to draw the line on progress. It sounds like what you're arguing is that, and I think there's some truth to this, but I'd love to, it sounds like what you're arguing is that like America actually needs progressives and conservatives and they need to like fight each other, right? And so like, you know, liberals were right about civil rights. Conservatives were right about the Cold War. And it kind of in America, it gets messy and it works each other out, but you might not want to live in a country that's just full of conservatives. And you might not want to live in a country that's just full of progressives. This would be like an optimistic thing to say, but it sounds like what, what you're saying. Yeah. I guess I, I mean, I think when I was younger, I was more of a progressive and I thought, here's how the world should be. And now I've come to a more ecological view of things that people play their roles. Um, and so progressives are playing their role. It doesn't make them evil. It just makes them, there are things they're not good at and they need others to play, to, to, to play that role. They're not the people who are gonna say, stop. If we had a world run entirely by conservatives, which we have often, things wouldn't get done that needed to get done. I mean, why is it that we're now, you know, 150, 160 war, we're just now getting around to, wait a minute, we have all these military bases? I mean, named after Confederate generals. Uh, there's, a, I mean, that's just one thing. But there's a lot of things that need to get cleaned up that you wouldn't get cleaned up if you didn't have progressives. So thank God for progressives. But you can't let them run everything, right? That's just crazy. And one argument to make be one argument that could be made about democracy and how democracy works is the progressives have their say for a while. Uh, you need that after you've had conservatives running things and a lot of things need to be changed. And then there'll be a backlash. And the Republican Party, hopefully after Trump, will come back as a, a clean conservative party with that remembers its values. And it will, what it will be speaking for is important because lines will need to be drawn at that point. Well, that's a, certainly an optimistic viewpoint, considering how depressing the news is. Um, but maybe, but I think there's some truth to it. Again, um, I guess the super, the danger is like if there got to a point where there was a tipping point where one side, as a, speaking as someone who is more conservative, uh, I see myself as like a center right person. Uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in the camp with like Jonah Goldberg. I mean, I, I believe that modern, you know, uh, America and civilization are basically is a miracle. And so it's also, it's, it's very tenuous and fragile and miraculous. And it can certainly should be reformed, but the danger is in um, sort of taking it for granted, right? And, and I've been playing Jenga with my kids lately. You know, you ever play Jenga? 
Yes. You, know, you build the tower and you could take out one block and literally nothing happens. It doesn't cave in just a little bit. It doesn't cave in at all. It's nothing. Take out another block. Nothing happens. Like it doesn't, it's not 1% less strong. It's a hundred percent as strong, but at some point you will take out a block and the whole thing collapses. And I was trying to, explain to my kids, like, think of this as a company. This is Bob in accounting. You take out Bob, nothing happens, never Bob, you know, but there's somebody in the company that if you take them out, things are going to go to hell. And then I tried to make this whole like civilizational uh, argument, which may or may not have been over their heads. So I am a little bit as a conservative person, I'm more worried about the excesses of the left. And I mean, obviously we've seen in other places, things like the French Revolution, where uh, things go, uh, go way, way too far. Are you, are you worried about that? I mean, whether it's like, let's talk about these statues, right? I don't think you or I really care if they take down a Robert E. Lee statue, but we saw them defacing an abolitionist in Philadelphia, maybe beheading, uh, vandalizing certainly uh, an abolitionist in Philadelphia. Um, I we've heard I've heard prominent progressive uh, commentators say they we should get rid of like uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, where where does it end? Does it end? Well, I can't get weepy about the statues. The one in Phil, the the, the uh, abolitionist that that was hilarious. That was uh, like the, that was it, that it was a parody of every cultural revolution where eventually yes. you have people who are just ignorant of history bulldozing everything. Um, but you know, I mean, the, one of the consequences of taking about a bunch of statues is not terrible. I'm much more concerned about assaults on the Bill of Rights. You know. Uh, uh, I have become over time sort of a negativist uh, and, a, and a more of a libertarian. Like I, I, I want to keep the American experiment going. We are, we have a nice progressive story going. We make progress, not all the time, but we, we prove it. We, we haven't gone off the rails, so we don't want to go off the rails. And going off the rails to me is if we start to uh, pare back free speech or in effect silence uh, dissent um, or if we just, even if we don't do it legally, I see a whole lot of cowardice. I see intimidation going on and people just not speaking up who are people in the middle. So uh, yeah, that's the, the thing that worries me most isn't the defacement of America. It's we need to hold together the Bill of Rights. We need to hold together the freedoms that allow us to continue to debate um, what we should be doing. And that way we don't turn into an authoritarian or a totalitarian country, which to me is the number one threat. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, yeah. I mean, look, I've spent, I mean, I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I said I've spent 80% of my time, certainly my column writing, going after Donald Trump and his authoritarian ways. So that has been by far my uh, my priority. Um, however, I am, I think I'm more concerned about what the left is up to right now than you are. I mean, you seem to have this attitude, which I admire actually, um, because I think it's important, like let, let not your heart be troubled. You know, um, you have this attitude, uh, that's like a happy warrior where you're, 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 being courageous you're not letting you're not afraid of these people you're not letting it get to you kind of a little bit like oh they defaced the statue of an abolitionist that's hilarious because it shows that they're idiots whereas i think i'm more tr i think i'm more troubled by that than than you are and it may be better for me if i were <laughs> if i had more like your attitude actually well matt what's your what's your big jenga block what's the thing that you're afraid of they're going to pull out and the whole thing's going to collapse well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, one of the things, and I, it, the funny thing is, actually, I never, would you believe I never played Jenga until like a week ago? <laughs> like in my whole life, I never did. And my kids, um, someone gave them uh, uh, a Jenga set. And so, uh, but the thing that I've been interested in is it's really hard to predict which block it is. Like when you're playing Jenga, there are blocks that, 
and you could test them a little bit. You can nudge them, but just with the naked, when you're like just looking at it, it's hard to tell which one is going to be the one that topples uh, civilization, which one is holding us together. But I think you start messing around too much with the foundation of something. And let's just take Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington. I mean, if we can't agree on George Washington, the founder of this country, who, this, you would talk about authoritarianism, this guy could have taken over like that if he wanted to. So he's fighting the Revolutionary War. He's a general. He could have declared himself emperor and they would have gladly let him. He goes, I think he goes to Annapolis and gives his sword over, resigns his commission, whatever, goes back to Mount Vernon. Then he gets elected president, serves two terms and steps down voluntarily and allows another election. George, if, if, if Donald Trump had the opportunity, does anybody think he would go back to Mount Vernon? No. So I think George Washington, not a perfect man, but someone, the, fa the father of this country, I think that we should just generally have some reverence for. And uh, now maybe we can get rid of that Jenga piece and it's fine, right? But like at some point, I, if, if we don't have a common history, if we don't have common, uh, a common story that we tell ourselves, I do think at some point that matters. You know, I, I, I'm skeptical that that block brings down the whole tower. Um, the, I mean, if I, if I try to imagine, let's suppose that the statue purgers get rid of everything, right? So they get rid of everybody who owns slaves. They get rid of everybody who is associated with, with slavery. We, we change all the currency. We get all these presidents off the bills who, who own slaves. Or do I think America is going to collapse? No. Let's say we get rid of, you know, Barack Obama, who was for most of his career against same-sex marriage, therefore clearly, you know, part of the forces of evil. Uh, we, we remove his name from everything. Now, I don't fetishize these guys. I admire what they've stood for uh, at their best, which has been tremendous. Um, they are, you know, as you say, George Washington, you know, God bless him. He had the power to destroy this country at the beginning and his self-restraint made us what we are. But he, we don't need his name to carry on what he, what he left us, right? We, what we need to preserve are the, li the liberties and the norms. Um, but I, so see, I think this is a, like a fundamental difference. And if you read my book, Too Dumb to Fail, <laughs> I spend, uh, which is mainly about, you know, Mainly, it's a critique of, of Trump and, uh, and Trumpism and uh, the dumbing down of the Republican Party. But I do spend like a chapter getting into this. And I think this is a fun, one of the fundamental differences between the left and the right is it goes back to, you know, Burke and the French Revolution. And you have people like Thomas Paine, who's a founding father, but believes that you can like begin the world new again and that there's the perfectibility of man. And then I think Burke is much more similar to kind of the concerns that I'm having, uh, which are that uh, you can certainly reform things, but that civilization is the product of, <laughs> you know, I mean, centuries of evolution, of slow evolution, and that it's a, a tenuous thing. And so, um, perhaps the fact that I'm, well, I don't even think perhaps, I think obviously the fact that I'm more worried about what's happening speaks to this different like political worldview that I, that I have. Let's, you know, I, I was just going to say, uh, I didn't know if you were going <laughs> to ponder it. Um, a couple of the things that you've been talking about that I thought were, uh, were, were, were courageous, uh, and speaking truth to power were one of them was the, the, the defund the police. Which, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, you were pointing out that like, if, if you don't mean the fund, don't say the fund. And, and you were one of the first people that was really hammering that point home. Um, the other one is the, uh, the Tom Cotton op-ed in the New York Times. Um, and uh, we could talk about it, but why don't you give me, give me your take uh, and then we can chat about it. A disgraceful, disgraceful episode. Just, just an embarrassment 
to liberalism. Uh, I think of the New York Times op-ed page, which I'll distinguish from the, the I'm a big fan of the New York Times. Uh, you know, my, my, my wife and I subscribe to the Times. I trust the New York Times reporting. Uh, I believe in it as an institution and I believe it will fix this. But this period has been an embarrassment and it has been a betrayal of the, what should be the liberalism of the op-ed page. And I do mean capital L liberalism. I commend the Times for having hired uh, colonists and editors who are somewhat more conservative, who were trying to uh, try, trying to bring, can I use the word diversity, um, into, um, I mean, it is wonderful to have ethnic diversity and racial diversity and gender diversity. I believe in all of that. I believe in all of that in part, not just because of equality, but because we are all smarter when we hear a variety of perspectives. And there are perspectives that you don't hear if everybody who works at your organization or writes for it is white or male. But that is also true of ideological perspective. And it is no insult to ethnic diversity or gender diversity to, uh, to say what is true. That is, there are a lot of places in this country that are conservative and don't hear from liberals. Those places get lazy and sloppy and backward. And that is true of, of progressives as well. If you work at a place where everybody thinks the same way, you know, we have right-minded progressive views here, and we just don't hear from the other side. You get sloppy and lazy and you become contemptuous of others and you don't even represent the viewpoints of those who disagree with you accurately. So what you're seeing at the New York Times is not only that they atrociously renounced Tom Cotton's op-ed with lies, just lies, about what he said, but that they, they were incapable of representing his argument fairly. So that speaks to, there is already a rot going on there that they can't see how the issue looks from another point of view. They already didn't have enough diversity in their newsroom or in their op-ed pages that they could faithfully understand what Tom Cotton was saying before they began to rebut it. So that's my view about that. What did they get wrong, factually? Factually. Uh, they, the number one thing that, I mean, there is at this moment, as we sit here, a note that has been appended to the top of that op-ed that says uh, uh, that he made some errors about uh, his, his, his statements about Antifa, which were no more, ten, they were no more tenuous given the evidence and things that are in the, um, that, that are, are used in, I mean, days after that, they published an op-ed that said abolish the police with factual claims at least as weak as that. But their, oh, their own news report about uh, re the retraction of the, about the renunciation, let's call it, of the op-ed. They published an article on June 4th about the controversy. They published another one a couple of days later when James Bennett was forced out, in which they said that Tom Cotton, that the op-ed, called for the, the deployment of the military against protesters. Okay, number one, Tom Cotton said the military should be called up to be there as backup, not that it should be put in the streets. It was there possibly to be put in the streets. He didn't say let's right now in places, but much more important, he was super clear in this op-ed. He said, we are there not to suppress protest. Protest is legitimate. P protest is part of the American story. It's part of the greatness of America that you can speak your mind, that you can protest. He said where they would be there to fight looters, vandals. Uh, I forget what, all of his description, but he drew that distinction at least twice. And the New York Times news stories completely trampled that distinction. And they claimed that he advocated the deployment of the military against protesters, which was a lie. And there is still, if I'm correct, still a June 4th story on the New York Times website that makes that false claim about what the op-ed said. That's disgraceful. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Cotton personally, um, but I am a huge fan of diversity of opinion and, and, and even the right to be wrong. And um, it just, it seems like they put that up I mean, Tom Cotton's viewpoint may or may not be right, but it, it's not a it's not a minor. I mean, it's not a fringe viewpoint. I mean, Cotton is a U.S. senator, a veteran, and someone who was representing 
a pretty large swath of American public opinion. And so uh, I think they were well within the rights to put it up. And then to back down and to fire that guy, uh, it, just, it just seems like we're in a position, that's part of what I find very scary, that you could, that, that the can, it's the cancel culture. Uh, and you know, what's the lesson that that sends, Will? What's the message if you're a New York Times writer or editor? What, what, what do you take from this? Well, the message that Salzberger, uh, the publisher, has, has sent is terrible. It is that he's going to capitulate to the, this goes back to your point about campus culture, this idea of, and this is, you know, John Hyatt has written very well about this, this idea of safetyism. The people on the, in the, in the, on the news staff felt that this was somehow a personal threat to them. And he just knuckled under, the publisher knuckled under to them and posted this, this grotesque uh, renunciation of the, of the article, which was false. And um, it says that uh, the publisher doesn't have your back. It says the publisher will blow with the wind. And when, you know, because it's in the nature of the progressives to push as far as they can, including to push their way into the arena and try to push others out of it. Um, you know, you need liberals, you need authorities to stand up to that. And he failed. He absolutely failed. And it, when the New York Times won't do that, I wonder who will. Liberalism. Um, I'm not so um, like the Polished. Um, but within institu smaller institutions like the New York Times, oh, I can see, you know, a, a sort of a reign of the, the liberal left um, to the point where the uh, next, you know, the next editor of the op-ed page just feels like they can't run the kinds of columns or op-eds that they did before because their job will be at risk. So it's not explicit censorship, but it's pressure and capitulation. Well, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, so, I don't know if it was the publisher. Somebody said, like, if, if, if you see something that's even the hint of that makes you uncomfortable, alert me, right? So it's like a whole bunch of, like, tattletales out there. Like, he said something I don't agree with. When does it happen when being pro-life um, puts the lives of women in danger? I mean, never mind the, the unborn child, but if, I, if you're a staffer at the New York Times and someone writes an op-ed that's pro-life, um, could that make you then feel the least bit uncomfortable and that, that, that being pro-life might endanger uh, the lives of women? You may argue, uh, maybe even Times staffers. So uh, I guess you, you can't have that viewpoint either, right? Because that could be offensive and harmful to some people. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely that could happen. That the anything that can be construed as anti-women, as you know, the pro-life position has, um, would would be in the category of a threat to a pro, a, a a a you know BFOQ, a, 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 a group of people, an ethnic or 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 sex group that is considered to be discriminated against historically, and therefore, you know, this is an oppressive argument, and we have to, I mean, they didn't even acknowledge that that was what they were, and when they, when they renounced the op-ed, they said it was for, for standards, not for viewpoint, but we all know it was for viewpoint, and we know it was because that they, they felt unsafe, and they, it was like a staff rebellion, but I agree with you, it's not well-founded. I have to say one thing, Matt, I feel, like I feel bad that I've, like, left you with the job of, a, of criticizing Tom Cotton and like as the left guy here in some way, I sort of not held up. I think, look, I don't think, Tom Cotton is a liar. Okay, Tom Cotton is a, a he has lied. He will be one of the people who will look you in the, the face and lie. He lied about the conversation with Donald Trump at the White House about the, you know, countries we don't want people to come from. Trump made racist comments and Cotton just flat out covered up for him and there were other witnesses to that. Um, Cotton is ruthless. So I don't mean to defend Tom Cotton in general, but my, my job is not to attack Tom Cotton no matter what he says. Because true. My job is to stand up against lies, right? So when Tom Cotton lies, I'm going to call him out because he's lying. 
And when the New York Times lies about Tom Cotton, I feel like one of the depth, this is not really a liberal progressive thing, this is a little bit different. My job is to speak for the truth and to speak out against the lie. And I think it's really important right now because particularly in the Trump era, when I feel like the United States government, the executive branch of the United States government, and I'll just say this, the Republican, the, the Congressional Republican Party, having capitulated and gone along with Trump, we are in the grip of a disinformation campaign or a disinformation regime. And, and our job is to, is to stand for truth. And that means not fighting the Republicans or fighting the Trump administration at every point, but standing, when we see something is false, we're gonna say it and we're gonna try to preserve so that when this is over, there is a common standard where left and right can argue things out and settle it by consulting facts. Yeah. Well, I mean, Trump has argued that the media is fake news and is biased. Um, and whenever the media behaves badly, they really are reinforcing his point. And why would you, if you were a conservative, and I'm not talking about like a right winger who reads Breitbart, but if you were like a conservative who's trying to like be knowledgeable and, and intellectually sort of open-minded and all this, why would you read the Times anymore? You know, I mean, maybe you're just going to go to the Wall Street Journal from now on. So I think it, this, this only expedites the, the polarization and the epistemic closure that we've seen. Um, and that I think is just, it, it just makes matters worse, of course. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many, what, one of the interesting things that happened to me after I tweeted about the New York Times lying about cotton was that oh, I got followed by a whole bunch of conservatives. And then I started to see them in my feed. And you know, Matt, it was extremely healthy. Like, I, cause I had ended up with a very left leaning feed and I'm on the left generally, but like when you feel accountable to people from, who come in from another point of view, it sort of opens your eyes to how they see things and what their concerns are. And one of the things that depresses me most about seeing what conservatives had to say about this is that to them, it just reinforced that they should never believe in anything they read in the New York Times, exactly what you're saying. And it, it hurts me because the New York Times is really important. The New York Times has published a lot of really important reporting. And I'm one of these people, I firmly believe the New York Times published terrific reporting about the Russia investigation. And Donald Trump wants to discredit all of that by telling his base guy, getting the entire right of America to disbelieve the New York Times. And by lying about Tom Cotton, about the whole process by which he reacted to that, that, that I had, the New York Times betrayed itself. It undercut its credibility with conservatives or conservative-leaning people at a time when it needed to stand up and say, you know what, we're gonna tell the truth no matter where, it, you know, no matter whose ox is gored. And this just gave people an excuse to go along with Trump, who, as you say, wants to discredit the entire media so that he can lie with abandon. Yep. All right, man. Good conversation. We end on a point of agreement. Uh, how can people read your stuff and follow you? Uh, so I, I write for Slate. Uh, I am the most right-wing person of a liberal or left-leaning magazine, but I encourage everyone, uh, if you to, to come, slate.com. Uh, is the address, and uh, and I'm on Twitter with just my last name, S A L E, like Sale Tan. Yeah, those two words together. That's that's my name. Uh, that's not how you pronounce it. Sorry. That's not how you pronounce it, though. No, no, I pronounce it Salatan, but nobody's gonna like be able to. Sale Tan. It's, yeah, you just go along. That's for for spelling. That's easier. I would buy a tan at this point. I, I like to argue with this guy a lot. Sometimes I agree with that. Awesome. Uh, great conversation. Check him out at Saletan. Will Salatan, thank you for coming on the news. Thanks for having me on, Matt. All right, buddy. That was great. Good. Thank you. That was fun. I felt like I was falling down on my job to be the... This, did, did I tell you the, uh, when I was on Charlie Sykes's podcast, uh, I, he, we were talking about something, I forget what it was, and I started going off about, you know, how the, about revolutions and all kinds of bad shit happens in revolutions. I did not curse, by the way, here, because I don't know what your audience is like, but I felt like it probably better not to curse. But Charlie, as you know, 
is just horrible with like, you know, he's, he's gonna talk to the, the course's language. Uh, so at one point I was talking about revolutions and he said, man, you sound, sound, you're, you're Edmund Burke here. <laughs> so I felt like I was definitely not doing my job if I was being compared to Edmund Burke. But Burke was, you know, I mean, you got a kid who's named after him, right? There you go. Burke was right about a lot of things. That's right. It's just, you know. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. I didn't really give you enough uh, pats on the back in this, but you're, you know, you guys have taken a lot more of a beating on the right than we've taken on the left. Well, maybe it's your turn in the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Amen. Okay, take care.